Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Industry Podcast, an esports insider podcast where we look at the people and personalities within the esports space. I'm your host, Kerry Wannanen, and today I'm joined by two guests. In a special episode, I'm joined by Bidstack founder and CEO James Draper, and also with the newly appointed non executive director and chairman designate David Reeves. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Wonderful. Very, very good. Side yep. outside, feeling good. Very, very positive. Yeah, it's a cooker today. How are you guys holding up in the heat? Yeah, we are. I'm okay. I don't mind the heat. It's quite, uh, uh, I, I much prefer it's the, uh, it's, it's the middle I don't like, Kerry. Yeah, I, I like the cold and I like the heat, but it's the middle. But anyway, we're, we're okay. Nice one. So I don't know if our listeners know too much about Bidstack. I actually hadn't really heard of the company before I was introduced um, by um, Esports Insider MD Sam Cook. But Bidstack is in the business of in-game advertising, which I think is fascinating. But before we hop in, James... I want to hear how you started Bidstack and how you got into the in-game advertising game. Cool. Um, so the company was set up initially in 2015, uh, Kerry. So it, we actually weren't initially in the in the world of video games. Uh, the initial mission of the company was actually to to bring uh, sort of programmatic, democratized um, technology uh, into the world of digital billboards in a real world that they would sit across multiple media owners. Uh, so they would be the likes of a JC the Co or Clear Channel, those names you see underneath the, the billboards out there in the wild. And we were looking to try and make those advertising hoardings more accessible, uh, particularly for smaller companies, but buy those spaces that normally were being sold via, uh, in the same way which you would buy posters, uh, like physical paper-based posters. So we set about that in 2015 and had a fair amount of traction. Came into the um, into the yeah the startup land with only with got ten thousand pounds initially. I managed to get out of a guy called Jason. That kind of like set the whole thing up and underway. And then you know through the phase of trying to look for extra funding, uh, we did a uh, a CrowdCube video, uh, which is an equity crowdfunding uh, website back in the end of 2015. And very uh, luckily, successfully raised uh, 137,000 uh, pounds from that. But in doing so, and the, the video type that we actually put together was deliberately going to be a bit tongue in cheek. So I don't know if you would have seen, Kerry, any, many of those type of videos that go up there on those equity crowdfunding sites. They're normally pretty dry. The CEO's on there with a bunch of charts that all point upwards. Uh, and it just felt quite a dull thing to do when you're giving out too much of your special sauce too early. Um, so we treated it much more of like a, a tongue-in-cheek um, uh, piece, which was kind of a bit of a rip-off of uh, the guys over at Dollar Shave Club, actually. Uh, so saw, I don't know if you've ever seen their, their their video, which kind of launched that product, but it was a, their CEO is a stand-up comic, and he, I definitely didn't want to put myself forward for that, but we hired an actor, uh, and it went down very well, and went, went spread across the media landscape, uh, across media planners, and it generated a lot of initial hype for the company. Uh, people presume we were much bigger than we were uh, when they were seeing this video because it's very high production. And what we saw is that there was lots of different types of media owners that would come towards us. So we had some conversations with, um, yeah, some some guys who owned some sport leagues uh, that had franchises that that would want to monetize around the side of their their real world football pitches. Uh, we had some guys come towards us involved with TV, connected TV. So. Um, our technology potentially could have worked in that environment as well. But the most interesting one really was was a friend of a friend who, who worked over at uh, Sports Interactive, uh, a Sega Europe uh, studio that does the game Football Manager. So it was uh, actually in January 2016. Uh, it was uh, the friend's uh, birthday and we, we just started talking over and showing off this, this silly little video. And just, just out of curiosity, I was like, how are you guys selling the, I used to play football manager and championship manager before that. How are you guys selling the, the ad space, the hoardings around the side of the pitch in the game? How are you doing that? Well, we're not really. We've got some licensed content. We've got some charities that we put in there. Um, we have some, some internal messaging, but it's all hard coded. So there's no targeting whatsoever. If you're playing in Brazil, UK, Japan, doesn't matter. Everyone's seeing the same content. So that kind of like sparked off this thing of like, 
okay, well, the the, the real world of, of digital billboard assets is was is very mature and it's filled with a lot of politics and some pretty legacy based software. Whilst this felt very much like if there's no one doing this over in the gaming space, yes, it might take a bit longer to warm all sides up uh, to this, but the win could be far bigger uh, for us. So started looking into it, saw between 2003 and 2010, there were, there were three companies that tried to do something similar. Um, first one was a company called Massive Incorporated. They went into Microsoft uh, for, they sold into Microsoft when they were very, very early. I think $1.8 million of total revenue in that time at that stage, and they, they went in for $187 million, uh, which is a hell of an exit, considering how early they were, uh, fair play to them. Um, and then that said about, there was there was two companies, Double Fusion and IJ Worldwide, that were set up and heavily funded out of the West Coast, uh, that, that gunned after particularly the PlayStation side of things. Um, so anyway, they all, it, it turned out that by 2010, they weren't existing in their in the original form. Some of them have been dissolved for their technology and just basically just it felt like the show had come to an end for them. So enough time had passed, I felt, for us to be able to reach out to uh, the founding team, so the former CEOs, technical teams, sales teams, to find out what their take was and what happened and also speak to some people in the gaming space. And it basically just turned out it was just too early. Really, so that on a on a buy side, in terms of from an advertising perspective, just the the level of targeting and the the, the automation around buying ad spaces was just so much in its infancy outside of like a Google or Facebook closed ecosystem. And also the gaming side, you know, you know, David knows just how far the gaming space has come through. Absolutely, like the speed of the speed now of broadband, 5G, subscription-based services, secondary audience down to competitive gaming due to the ability for people to play competitively, competitively together. Obviously, esports and cyber being absolute guidelines and all that. Um, so it's, it's, it, we felt that the whole space had matured a fair bit, so we decided to, to move into, into the world of gaming um, at the back end of 2017 when we agreed a three-year deal with, with Sega. Um, and without sort of like just coming off way too much too early, that kind of like the, the company was like born into the gaming space from then, listed up in 2018 on the, on the London Stock Exchange, and listed up with like sub 10 people in the company. So we were very early um, and we've, we've kind of grown up in the, in the public eye. And we're now over 80 people working with over 100 games and, and the company's starting to, to mature, which is, you know, been quite an exciting journey. That is a wild journey. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, you sort of went from, yeah, it's sort of targeting stuff out on the street, as you were saying, like posters and such. Then you went on the internet to do a like a crowd fund, and then cheeky got a little uh, got a little attention there. And then you just had a, a meeting with um, football manager, and which is an underrated title, especially my former colleague um, Tom Daniels at Esports Insider. He is probably the biggest fan of football manager on the planet. So he, he's going to love that little bit, but David, you have just joined very recently and looking at your LinkedIn, you have a illustrious history in the gaming space all over Europe. And I would love to hear your journey, how you got started in gaming and even also before gaming, but also then what led you to join Bidstack? Yeah. Okay. Um, my, I, I guess my history, uh, Kerry is not as interesting as, as James. I'm actually um, really an astrophysicist. Um, I was uh, coding stuff for my PhD in Algol and Fortran uh, really long before, this was the uh, early 70s, long before video games really came into, into, into being. My uh, history is that I did a PhD that involved me working on the Apollo program um for uh for a while on the on the portholes of the apollo craft and then i uh i came back to the uh uk after apollo wrapped up uh and i finished the phd and i i just made a complete departure and i went into into marketing i did an mba in the uk and i signed on for a really big um tobacco company uh which was john players uh part of imperial group and uh I really made the transition, I guess, from science or computer science and uh, astrophysics into uh, in, 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 into marketing. And uh, I got to the point 
where I traveled the world for 17 years with this big American company. I was in Geneva, Lucerne. I was in Johannesburg, um, North Carolina, uh, and Germany. And I ended up in uh, with them, this American company, in uh, in Tokyo. And of course, Tokyo is the not quite the home of games, but it, it's uh, it's one of the birthplaces. And I was working with a joint venture with this American company, with a Japanese company called Mitsubishi. I eventually worked there for nearly five years. And uh, we used to play golf against Sony. That's how Japanese work. They, the corporations play against each other. Um, and I'm in the worst golfer in the world. But uh, what happened was that the probably the second worst golfer in the world was someone who was working for uh, Sony, uh, and uh, it happened to be well he and the CFO, uh, the father of PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi, and the CFO were both terrible golfers, and we always got the booby prize. But we all we became friends over a period of I don't know about two years, uh, and uh, he uh, they got to tell me about PlayStation and that they were going to put. Um, games onto discs and he was going to introduce a, a disc-based system and in fact they did it in November 1994. Uh, to cut a long story short, I kept in touch with them. Uh, my Japanese wasn't too bad and in the end they offered me, this is Sony PlayStation in Japan, they offered me the chance to start PlayStation in Germany, Switzerland and Austria and that's really uh, what I did in, and we launched PlayStation in September 29th, 1995. And that was my hit, that was where I started in the, uh, in the games industry. Uh, having known really, Kerry, very, very little about it, but being of a scientific and I guess marketing uh, background. And the, the games industry then in Germany was, it was the early stages, I guess, of uh, what you might call esports, and but they didn't call it that. They called them LAN parties. I don't know if you remember those, Kerry, but you used to go into this big mesa or hall in the in the mesa, and it was gigantic, and there would probably be a thousand German, Austrian, Swiss gamers there, really quiet, just looking forward and play and doing LAN parties. And it was really very, very quiet. It didn't seem like esports at all, but that's probably what they thought uh, they were doing. And I suppose that was my first uh, introduction to it. My second introduction was really quite different, is that um, there is a game called Gran Turismo, and it's developed by a company called Polyphony Digital in Tokyo by the producers called yamuchi -san. And he was quite interested in trying to put into Gran Turismo advertising uh, and different billboards. Um, I think he'd been inspired by a game that you may remember called Ridge Racer, which used to have billboards around there. And it was a little bit crazy. And it used to sometimes go 100 kilometers an hour and sometimes it two kilometers an hour, but it was a great game. Anyway, Gran Turismo was a different generation. And so he, he started to put uh, uh, Nissan GT uh, logos into the, into the game. And uh, he asked the Japanese engineers if they could try and put something into these, uh, in, in, into these games, um, you know, to, uh, to actually spice it up and also to enhance the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis that were in the game and give them some exposure. So that was really, really early days. They did it, but uh, unfortunately, the, the, the serving into, into, the, into the games wasn't fast enough for the games themselves. So uh, it was too early. This was about 2001, 2002. You, pro you probably weren't even born then, Kerry, but um, uh, that, that is uh, how it... Uh, how it started, but it it, uh, it it was it was there, and uh, I suppose that the next experience I had with uh, uh, advertising in 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 that world was that PlayStation sponsored um, a uh, game 
which was the UEFA Champions League, and it still goes on now. And we were a sponsor, and I don't know, it was probably about $6 million. It's probably about $106 million now to put PlayStation banners around the, uh, around the stadium, whether they are in Germany or Amsterdam or, uh, or, or London or Paris. And uh, we tried to convince people like Seth Blatter that just having this static poster or billboard around wasn't really very exciting. And we asked them to see whether they could, you know, they would allow us to uh, to make it a little bit more mechanical, a little bit more ex exciting. But being Swiss, they said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. We, you have PlayStation. That's it. Right. And <laughs> so we, we, we couldn't do much about it. But we did develop something to try and uh, spice it up. And I don't know if you realize now, but uh, serving games into... Um, into soccer stadia does happen now and it is a, a lot more exciting and it means that the income that is generated for people like uh, uefa is probably a hundred times more because you're not seeing a playstation ad for uh, 90 minutes plus the half time what you're seeing is probably 20 different ads which are being put on these billboards in different ways so that's a long way from from esports but I suppose my true experience of these sports was that going from the LAN parties at the uh, Leipzig, uh, you know, games convention, as it was called then, where it was all very quiet, having lived in the Far East, I visited Seoul, and I guess that must have been, I don't know, 2004, 2005. And I went into an environment, Kerry, that you will understand, and probably James as well, where it was just absolutely raucous. I mean, there were people in these uh, uh, environments, arena in Seoul, who were cheering on the uh, the esports competitors because they were rock stars. So it was really totally different from the uh, from the from the German the the German experience. Um, frankly. I have not been a follower of esports very much, largely because I think it has been, until recently, quite difficult to monetize. You get the enthusiasm there, but you're not actually making, the companies aren't actually making too much money. You know, you can do it through the esports franchise, you can do it through entertainment, and you can do it as you've done in the last five or six years through apparel. But my belief is, and I know James believes as well, that if you serve the right advertising into the esports spectators, that you are, you've got to make it data driven such that those esports spectators respond either consciously or subconsciously to the ads. And what you are there doing is, di is generating indirectly money. And it's exactly the same as free to play. It took a while to generate it. In-app purchases were a little bit difficult. But the, the way that advertising now as reward ads to get you to another level is the way that it could work in esports. But you've got to have adverts that are appealing to the esports spectators, not necessarily to the gamers. So that is why I've come to the conclusion that it is definitely worth uh, getting into combining advertising with uh, esports, but in a very, very different data-driven way, Kerry. Sorry, that's a bit of a monologue, but I thought I'd uh, just give you uh, some of the background. That was great. Thanks so much for that. I mean, uh, I had no idea that I would be hosting the, the first astrophysicist on, a uh, former astrophysicist on the podcast. Um, that's was a surprise to me. And you also flatter me by, uh, assuming that I was born 
before 2000 or after 2004. I'm uh, a little bit older than you think. My hairline gives that away a bit, but... Uh, well, we all do. We, none of us have any hair today. Yeah. Do so I can, I can identify a lot with that, with David, with what you're talking about, with like the European land parties and how that now went away with, um, with the global health situation and now is coming back in a big way. Everybody's super hungry for you land. Know, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. really people are, are really hyped up for lands. There's dream hack is coming back in full force all over the planet um, has, has come back in full force. And also what I think is a really interesting development is that land centers are also coming back, especially in uh, the West. There've always been sort of a thing in, um, in the East with, with the PC banks in Korea and the cyber cafes, internet cafes in China as well. But now because it's a social aspect, esports and gaming is more social than it's ever been. That people are interested in going to just like a you know a, just like going to a game or going to a bar or whatever. Like, hey, instead of let's pl like playing online together, let's go to the the land center and we can play together then because. They have the best equipment, better than you can afford at home. They're constantly updated because they have these partnerships now because they're all trying to advertise to this audience as well. But David, something I wanted to, I wanted to speak with both you and James about is something that you mentioned, David, which is there's a, a big difference in the esports advertising that you mentioned for the esports audience versus the gamer audience. But from what I understand, Bidstack does in-game advertising for just gamers, game, games that are not esports titles, that with like indie developers and such, and that they can create a more realistic and authentic world feel with the in-game advertisement. But that is a different experience than advertising in an esports um, match or tournament or something like that in-game for a very different audience. So James, do you wanna, you wanna pop in and, and tell me a little bit about what the big difference is in your opinion there? Well, this, it's comes down to, we're a technology company, right? So cut myself off a little bit in terms of giving a whole sort of background to the business, but really we are, we are a technology firm now. We've had to do, be a media company and a tech firm, but if you look what our technology does, it's an SDK, which you, we, we, we're very lucky that some of the world's biggest uh, game developers have trusted to put our technology into uh, their environments. So what does it do? It basically enables us to serve content into predefined spaces within a video game gameplay, uh, depending on who that person is. So we don't know their, we don't know their name, we don't know precisely who it is, but we know that it's, we can target by age, gender, and location. Now, there's additional things that we are looking to target on top of that, but that's just, if you just look at that as a, a, a baseline. So the way in which we can allow, for example, a, a, an eSports uh, tournament broadcaster, uh, we could allow, we could allow uh, those guys to basically ring fence the three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, uh, PCs, consoles, mobiles, whatever it might be, and, and lock those lock those spaces down and allow the, the the official partners of that particular tournament to be inserted only into uh, those eight, um, eight eight computers, eight environments. So that's that's quite a useful thing to be able to do. So basically if you think about also on top of that, so the three of us in terms of how the technology works, three of us could be in the same environment, same race at the same time everything's uh, exactly the same except we can allow advertisers to go and switch out certain items um predominantly it started off with billboards but now it can be shirt sponsors skins um any really any texture which the the game developer gives us control of we can swap it out initially we're doing that purely on 2d but it can be 3d um, objects we can swap out as well so it's that's the real sort of core facet of it. Now, how the commercial terms of that work out, kind of there's been, again, we've had to do a bit of everything through the whole journey of the company, right? So imagine when we, we so 
I mentioned when we first looked at moving into this space, back in 2017, 2018, even 2019, there was not a single individual in any of the major uh, agency, ad agency holding groups that had a remit surrounding going to uh, their, their advertisers, their clients, and trying to carve out a gaming budget to go and activate for them. Not a single person, you can go to a WPP, a Dentsu, whoever, the big agency holding groups that control most of the world's advertising budgets on behalf of uh, the big brands. That's very much changed now. So we fast forward to where we are today. Um, there's something called the IEB and the, the MRC. The IEB is, is, is the uh, Interactive Advertising Bureau, and it basically allows them to, they are like a governing body of, of the um, advertising industry. Then you've got the Media Rating Council as well. They both work together to try and standardize and, and, and educate and make it safe for media plans to go and spend money in video game environments. So you imagine between 2003, 2010, there's a bit of work that was done and actually we're, we're taking some of the workings they used back then, um, pulling it forward. Now the market has matured and particularly on the gaming side. And what we're seeing is that I think when we first started looking at deploying budgets, getting budgets in uh, into our inventory, which is initially just Football Manager, then Codemaster, we started ramping from there. Um, we're looking at like three, 5,000 pounds-ish is what we get per campaign, really tiny micro spends to where we are now like the, the size of the briefs that come across i mean we signed a, a deal in the end of last year which was uh, for someone to go and represent our inv inventory to the agency holding groups for 30 million dollars for two years so that's a hell of a jump in terms of what you see in there but that's again splitting it so we're allowing the agencies to come into shipped version retail versions of titles but what we can do is, is do a pure tech play with the game publisher or a tournament organizer where they can go, okay, no external advertising. We just want to ring fence these IP, these particular IP addresses, and then serve our brand partners into it. And then we just charge a tech fee the other side of that. And what, what we're seeing is that that's, I mean, David hinted it earlier, but one of the guys on our, on our board in addition to, you know, the excellent, very, humbling uh, addition of David onto our board is a guy called Glenn Calvert, who was uh, the COO running Fnatic uh, alongside Sam over there. So he's given us a good bit of guidance around really enabling streamers to go and monetize. And you could imagine eventually there'd be a situation where we could, for certain titles, when the publisher's happy, allow you, Kerry, if you wanted to, if you're playing a particular title, you could lock your IP and bring your own whatever, it could be a, a local partner which you want to go put into your game environment for your streamers to see. We can, our technology does that at a basic form. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a steer around it. So you've got open market, open auction type buying coming in, and then you can still just use our technology just to ring fence certain tournaments, certain situations as and when required. It's just the technology can is very adaptable like that. Yeah, and what I think is like really interesting is as you were saying, James, that you can create a sort of like fenced off version of your product for like you're saying, like if it's if it's a local tournament or whatever. And so let's say I want to host a tournament. Um, I'm going to invite a bunch of local Amsterdam streamers. We're going to host something together. And um, I want to then put inventory out there. Potentially, I would get more interest from local advertisers that are interested in the people that are watching here and like the the viewers and also the the players themselves. Or let's say I want to go big and I want to host this tournament uh, across Europe, which has very different markets and very different products and very different audiences. That then you can also choose for these types of ads to be shown. Correct. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. So. so like technically you don't have to get super technical if you don't want to. Um, but from what I'm imagining is that the environments that you're getting in game, you were saying that, that it is generally 2d, but you can also do 3d. I'm envisioning that it's sort of like a green screen situation that as something, as a game loads up or whatever, that then there's like an inventory 
that then gets populated onto this surface that will be different per per viewer or per market or whatever you you decide. But I'm no expert, so please uh, please please illuminate me a little bit if I'm way off. No, that's actually a good way of explaining. It, I think um, it's it's the, the way in which we're loading in the assets, um, particularly if it's an advertising asset. We keep it like simple for that for a second. If it's just an advertising asset, then it's each time a session is is booted up. Now, could be a session could be um, each time the game the game lo loads in. Um, so, if it could be a particular go, or it'd be a case if you go back to the menu screen, you go into a game for the first time. Uh, what when it's loading in assets for the uh, the level, it's also pinging our server and it's it's communicating over the again the age, gender, and location of that said individual. Um, and if there is a uh, if there's a, a budget tied to that particular type of individual, it will pull through the asset and display it. And then what it will do then, it will then ping our server when it's it's been fully rendered in and in view. There's been a whole bunch of viewability technology which we've had to develop out with Oracle um, and uh, particularly their, their division uh, moat around that. And that's the math around that is around time on screen viewability angle, and at that stage, we've had to then get the likes of the IOB and MRC to kind of like mark our homework and go, okay, we split it down actually, as well, Kerry, we split it down into three different environments. So you've got like a closed stadium environment, you've got an open world environment, um, and then you've got really, it's a, it's a like a racing game, point-to-point um, -point environment, and all three are kind of biddable differently. Um, you can put most games into those categories, so a closed arena, a stadium, and a also sort of a point to point with traveling through a level. Uh, and that's the way in which they build is all different. And we've had to work with, when we, we looked at moving into this uh, space, again, so there was no one globally doing this, but now there's 14, 15 companies that we know of that are, are trying to do this uh, as well of various different levels of maturity as a, as a company. Um, so we're having to work alongside those guys to help agree on uh, what we believe collectively is, is how we should build for this type of uh, inventory. Uh, but we've now got there, luckily. Uh, so that's, it's mean there's more budgets available to streamers, to game publishers, which is quite important because the media planners are quite hot at it now. Uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and and like this type of thing, this media and advertising assets is super important to the monetization, as you were speaking on, David, uh, monetization of the industry. And as you were talking a little bit before about your your history of how you started outside of the industry, then you went into marketing, and you and then you came into gaming all through being, um, I mean, no offense, but not being a very good golfer. You, uh, you're able to enter into, uh, into the gaming space and you've been there for a, for a long time. So I'm really curious, David, to having seen just the span of, of both being in the Far East and in the US and in Europe and such, and where we are now with the availability of the technology that we have joining Bidstack, um, where do you hope to drive uh, this, this rocket ship towards the future? I think um, the answer, very simply, Kerry, is to harness the creativity that James and his marketing, sales, and technical team have and make sure that they are aligned on certain income streams and that they, these income streams are directed not necessarily towards esports gamers, but they are directed towards an audience that want to see some of this advertising and they are happy to see uh, the advertising and that has to be uh, data driven. If you like, my role is an alignment of the, the stars, I, not celestial stars, but stars like James, who have that creative ability and we just need to make sure it's aligned and we're all heading in the same direction or if we want to have directions income streams then we know which directions that we are 
going in. And that is what I've done for companies in the past, Kerry, be it uh, PlayStation in Europe or uh, Capcom um, or even more recently other companies that um, have grown on the basis of servicing the, uh, the, the, the video game uh, industry. I'm not creative myself, but I sometimes do bring a little bit of structure to organizations. And I think that's what, uh, that's what we need to, uh, to do. And I see that uh, Bitstack has, has structure, but it just needs to uh, consolidate the direction in which it goes. And it will be extremely successful. Kerry, I have ab absolutely uh, no doubt. But I would say at the same time that it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, and whether you're, you're talking about uh, esports gamers or gamers or uh, people in the industry, they, they are very low ego, basically. They are rock stars in some sense in that they are brilliant at what they do, but they're relatively low ego. And I like that. I like that. Uh, if you go into, uh, I don't know, retail, or if you go into, you know, Procter & Gamble and things like that, they tend to be, they, they tend to have, uh, I, perhaps I shouldn't say this, just bigger egos. But the games industry is not like, is not like that. They, they, they all got their feet on the ground, Kerry, you know, and that's what I, I really like. And I see that within Bidstack as well as other, uh, you know, other uh, companies uh, in the same ecosystem. Yeah, I like to refer to esports as the startup of industries. And I think that, I mean, it has grown, obviously, with the, the gaming industry and the gaming industry is... 40, 50 years old. I mean, the video gaming industry will say. So it's also relatively young. So this maybe could be the sense that because it's so young and scrappy that people just can't really afford to have egos because they really need to be forming relationships. And especially esports, esports is a pretty small industry in general. So you don't really want to have a bad reputation of having an ego in this sense, but also maybe the, the type of people that are interested in working in this space have a certain personality trait that isn't so, so I guess, egotistical. But James and David, I'm both curious to hear your thoughts on what lies in the future. Like what, I mean, you've just signed this massive deal with Azerian uh, for, for a few years for a massive sum of money, which basically takes a little bit off, off of your plate, I think in some aspects, but also maybe a bit of pressure in other senses, but what what is what sits in the future in your eyes in terms of not only in-game advertising but advertising in-game for esports? I would say what we've been surprised at is that the by existing in this space, I think what we've been quite happy about is the amount of companies and opportunities that have come towards us to use the same technology. Right, so what we started off with was a way back when a company was started, you know, we're trying to, to allow smaller brands to go and buy uh, spaces within real unattainable uh, advertising spaces, um, digital billboard assets. Then we came over to the gaming space and you know, there's an awful lot of work and, you know, we started off with quite a, a, a low tech API and we've built out a very complex system now that, that is confidently sitting within uh, some of the most advanced and legacy game engines on the planet. Um, and we've got the trust of the gaming studio directors, which I think is really important first. Then what we've seen is that you kind of you strip the, the, the things down to like, so what's it actually doing? What's that technology actually doing? Now we, you come on to bidstat.com, you'll see it's for now, in-game advertising only but actually what the technology does it enables 
Um, again, asked to be able to take control of a space that's predefined by the game publisher. And content can be inserted into that space depending on who's looking at it. It doesn't have to be advertising. It doesn't have to be... Uh, there's different types of stakeholders that we're seeing in and around uh, the environments that we've had access and, and control of that want to do different things with that technology. They want to be able to assert in, for example, uh, user acquisition messaging uh, on a per territory basis. So if they, if they want to, if the game publisher themselves wants to communicate directly to a, uh, a particular set of customers that might be playing in a particular country, they can do targeted by language advertising to them, which is just not possible before, which is so basic and simple and easy for us to be able to provide. There's that one particular thing there. On top of that, what we've seen is that game developers have gone, okay, we want, we don't want to work with multiple providers. We don't want to work with someone who's bringing ads into one part of our ecosystem. And, you know, you guys are doing the in-game play piece. Could you do more than that? So what we've developed our technology around is to be able to house inventory within an ecosystem. An ecosystem could be one game, could be several games within a portfolio. It could be an entire platform's worth of, of of inventory, again, just spaces within the UI, reward video opportunities, and also the in-game play stuff. So what we've what we've seen from that is that you know some of the some of the some of the titles that we've been talking to and have contractually, lucky for us, uh, signed with have got very very large outgoings for things like buying in rights to make the environments feel real. But the way in which for example, those relationships work with those rights holders in that particular instance. It's it's very analog. There's very little information that's been given back to the rights holders. Why it's a very, I'll give you this much money to buy the IP. We're going to go and monetize it the other side with a whole bunch of do's and don'ts around it. But there's very limited uh, control given back to the IP holder once the, the IP is in the environment. Now, through our technology, we enable the game developers to potentially gift over some control back over to those IP holders to control stadium, stickers on cars, whatever it might be, shirt sponsors, skins, whatever it might be. So actually that, that's when you start looking at it and it's okay, I'm not randomly just, just going off on one on it. It's it's a it's quite important to sort of like it shows us multiple commercial opportunities around the same software. Um, and what we're seeing is that because now and then, you know, the, the very near future, you're going to see that it's going to be possible for open market buying to be to to give access to brands to go and buy in a fully automated way spaces within gaming environments. It'll probably initially be purely mobile um, and it'll be on probably more independent developers. Uh, but it's you'll see that there'll be a lot more ad dollars flowing into the gaming environment. But we've got to make sure we're always thinking about the the Reddit community, the game gamer community, and making sure we don't ruin the immersion and destroy what great artwork's being created by the studios. But if we can enable those studios to create additional income, retain the value of the real estate, then everyone kind of wins. So that's kind of how I see it. Um, and again, it's What's quite important to us is that our platform, we want to try and get it into as many people's hands as possible using the same technology for different use cases. So Kerry would like to be great if, you know, if, if lots of different streamers were to use our technology going forward, but it's really down to the control of the, the, if the, if a game developer is happy for that to happen, which I'm sure they will do via esports to certain teams, that'd be part of a, an agreement uh, for those, uh, those individual teams in particularly official tournaments. So hopefully that gives you a rough idea around it. No, oh, yeah. And I think that that's like sort of a creative way to use to use technology, but also as a way to make it, I don't want to say worthwhile, but more, more valuable, I suppose, especially with the esports audience. Um, and because so much content has been free for the audience for so long, that monetizing content is incredibly difficult, which is why there's so many brand partnerships and that they have content, like content delivery aspects in their agreements 
because somebody has to pay for this content if they're not, if the brands themselves are not able to monetize it from the audience or sorry, not the brands, but like the organizations or the creators or whoever, if the audience isn't helping uh, pay the bills of creating this content, then they have to seek that elsewhere. And so sort of what you're proposing, David, and also you, you alluded to it a little bit too, James, is that by allowing brands and advertisers and just also like, like, I think also something we didn't really talk about, but is a possibility is sort of like internal marketing as well, like advertising other parts, like within, let's say just a company like Riot, be able to advertise Riot's other products within one of their IPs to advertise, okay, yeah. you're playing Valorant or you're watching Valorant. You can also see League of Legends or you can see a preview for the the Project L, the fighting game that they're, they're looking to put out. You can see that in game. You can only access that maybe in game. This can create a really interesting way to, to create something that a lot of people are uh, calling the metaverse. Um, but it's just all video games to me. <laughs> it's just all video games, <laughs> but amazing to have you guys on, uh, on the pod today. Uh, where you have just, uh, hit the end of our time, but really, really wonderful. It has been a pleasure. Um, where can people find you if they want to learn more about not only Bidstack, but about, uh, your guys, you guys. I mean, always available on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to go and come along and add me and always open to, 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 to talk with pretty much anyone. Um, but obviously bidstack.com gives a bit more of an explanation around the in-game advertising story. So, but that's the best way to come and find us. Come over to, to LinkedIn. We're happy to talk. Yeah. So, so same for me. Um, it's just a question of time, Kerry, but uh, very open to, to talk to people or to uh, to, to um, hook up on uh, on LinkedIn if that's, uh, yeah, no, no problem at all. Nice. Well, guys, thank you so much again for, for joining the pod and uh, looking forward to um, seeing the future of in-game advertising brought to us by Bidstack. Thank you, Kerry. Gary, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. A pleasure.